Thank you. And now here's David to give us our scripture for today. A reading from the book of 1 Kings. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in a vision by night, and God said to him, Ask that which I should give you. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown to thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in faithfulness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is to this day. And now, O Lord God, thou hast made thy servant king in place of David my father, and, I'm a, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in among thy people, whom thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore to thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people and to discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy, great, thy so great a people? And it pleased the Lord, because Solomon had asked this thing. And the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself riches, nor have you asked the lives of your enemies, nor have you asked for yourself long life, but have asked for yourself wisdom to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to your words. Lo, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has been none like you before you, neither shall any arise after you like you. And I have also given you that which you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall be, so there shall not be any among the kings like you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as your father David did walk, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. And now Reverend Macaulay will give us our lesson sermon. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Today's lesson is on keeping our mentalities uncluttered on Father's Day 2008. In today's scripture, we heard some verses from the first book of Kings about the story of Solomon getting wisdom and understanding, and that if you have wise thoughts, all else will be added unto you. And if you listen carefully, in that passage lies the entire lesson on abundance. Father's Day is a day set aside to honor fathers everywhere. Most of us had fathers when we were growing up, and if our biological fathers weren't around, hopefully we adopted surrogate fathers. And I found this little passage on the uh, web about Father's Day. Mrs. John B. Dodd of Washington State first proposed the idea of a Father's Day in 1909. Mrs. Dodd wanted a special day to honor her father, William Smart, William Smart, a Civil War veteran, was widowed when his wife, Mrs. Dodd's mother, died in childbirth with her sixth child. Mr. Smart was left to raise the newborn and his other five children by himself on a rural farm in eastern Washington state. It was after Mrs. Dodd became an adult that she realized the strength and selflessness of her father that her father had shown in raising his children as a single parent. The first Father's Day was observed on June 19, 1910, in Spokane, Washington. About the same time, in various towns and cities across America, other people were beginning to celebrate a Father's Day. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge supported the idea of a national Father's Day. Finally, in 1966, President Lyndon Johnson signed a presidential proclamation declaring the third Sunday of June as Father's Day. Father's Day has become a day to not only honor your father, but all men who act as a father figure. Stepfathers, uncles, grandfathers, and adult male friends are all honored on Father's Day. 
So today, let's take a moment to think about all the father figures in our lives who contributed in one way or another to our growth and development. In preparing today's lesson, I was thinking about what we've been discussing in the advanced class. We're currently reading course four, Advanced Self-Help, and we've been discussing how our thoughts shape our environment. The idea that each one of us is the product of our thoughts is not new, but it's a good idea to review from time to time. In lesson five on your atmosphere in the making, Dr. Bissell discusses how we build our figurative houses or how we build the universe in which we live. He's speaking metaphorically, symbolically, but his thoughts are worth reviewing and considering from time to time. This universe, Dr. Bissell says, is a composite whole of all the tiny important and unimportant thoughts and reactions which go into a lifetime. We know that our mentalities are like a huge garden in which each thought we think is like a seed planted in that garden. If our seed thoughts are full of joy, love, gratitude, and peace, then our gardens will produce fruits of joy, love, gratitude, and peace. If our seed thoughts are of anger, envy, jealousy, or hatred, then we will harvest that anger, envy, jealousy, and hatred in our lives. And those negative thoughts bring about negative emotions which can fester and create disastrous medical conditions in our bodies. We know we have a choice about how we allow our mentalities to operate. We can choose to allow the negative thoughts into our mentalities, or we can choose not to allow those thoughts into our mentalities. In thinking about this, I was not reminded of how Carol Ryder, former astrologer to the stars and member of Dr. Bissell's church, refused to use the word cancer in his writings on astrology. He used the expression moon children rather than allow the C word into his mentality. At some point in my metaphysical development, I knew that I had to eliminate four-letter words from my vocabulary and from my mentality. Actually, for me, I began to substitute the word mercy every time I wanted to use a four-letter word. At first, it was as if I was mocking my mother, who used that expression for as long as I can remember. Over time, however, I found that it was interesting to watch how people respond when I utter the expression mercy, rather than a litany of four-letter words, as many of us are capable of doing. Sometimes it's such a surprise that it disarms an aggressor, even momentarily, or lightens up an otherwise tense situation with a brief injection of humor. Dr. Lyle said recently that he had heard that the average human experiences about 60,000 thoughts per day. That's 6,000 thoughts in 10 hours, or 600 thoughts an hour, or about 10 thoughts a minute. Non-stop, kind of like the heart beating constantly with no opportunity for a break except for a fraction of a second between beats. The difference between the heart beating and the mentality processing thoughts is that the heart beats autonomously, automatically, without our having to think about it or request or approve it. The heart just works. The mentality, on the other hand, is like a computer processor with thoughts entering in, being processed, considered, acted upon or ignored, and sometimes we get overwhelmed or overloaded and our brains either shut down or stall while we try to process everything we're exposed to. The point is we have a choice about how we process these thoughts, and we have to be diligent about what we, thoughts we allow in and about what thoughts we choose to discard or ignore. 